syndicate of crime. But does that mean Neil Eichelberger? Well, if it turns out to be Eichelberger, we'll take care of that. Anyway, they've got me in to see if I can clean things up. Well, what specifically are you after, Mr. Conroy? Everything illegal, bookies, slot machines, graft, corruption. And you think the Eichelberger syndicate controls all this? If it does, we'll find it out. When we find it out, we'll break it up. Do you think the situation is serious enough to call for such measures? Well, for some reason or other, the pendulum seems to have swung back again. And as your newspapers have repeatedly pointed out, the city has become infested with crime again. It'll be our job to wipe it out. Oh, uh, please don't ask me how. <laughs> Thanks. May we have a picture, please? Yeah, sure. Help yourself. Checking hands with Mr. Fogel. Yeah, certainly. Thank you. Thanks a lot, fellas. I'm going to need your help. I know you'll go along with me. I'll give you everything I can as soon as I can. There's nothing more now, believe me. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Conroy. Oh, oh, say, listen, what do you yeah. think? Boyish charm? Are you kidding me? You'll need more than that. We'll no, find no, out no, when we do. No, we'll break it up. Just like that. You'll want to get organized. Shall we make it 12.30 in the mayor's office? Fine. Thank you very Good much. Good luck, Mr. Conroy. Thank and you. you know the department is squarely behind you. Thank you very much, Captain. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Mandy! Oh. Hello, Johnny. <laughs> I was wondering about you. Oh, Johnny, please. Oh, dignity beginning at noon. <laughs> We've been here since six. Order will come later. Oh, one thing I want for myself. A car with a siren and a red light. You don't think it might be misunderstood? Okay, we'll skip the light. Hi. Jerry. Hi, kid. I was looking for you in that crowd. I'll let you get the bugs out of your system. Congratulations. Thanks. This is great, Jerry. Oh, uh, Jerry McKibben, Miss Waycross. How do you do? Hello. Amanda's helping me out. Combination Girl Friday and Spiritual Advisor. Johnny. Also picnics on weekends. Amanda Waycross? Yes, why? I just want to get the names of the Brain Trust right. Oh. Now, you got into a crime wave. Should make quite a story. On the society page. Jerry's a reporter. I was beginning to suspect. Congratulations, anyway. Thank you. Jerry and I grew up together down in Caroline Street. It's nice you both have such important friends. Yes, isn't it? Uh, Johnny, there are all kinds of messages, none of them less than cosmic. And your mother called. I promised I'd have breakfast with them. Come on with me, Jerry. We can talk. I'll ride along, but they'll want to have their dear boy to themselves. No, they'll want to see you. It's been years. If anyone calls? Tell them he just went out to get tattooed. I suppose that's as good as anything. And please call the house. Say I'm on my way. Jerry. I'm supposed to do some color stuff on you, Johnny. You feel like a colorful character? Not exactly. How's it been with you? Oh, scraping by. I've read some of your stuff. Very tough, very bright. There's a trick to it. I propose the problems, but never suggest the solution. What are the problems? Vice, graft, corruption, war. None of it's simple. We're weak human beings, and the human equation smears everything up. All too sound. You're the boy for the solutions. So it seems. Why don't you help us out? How? Take a leave of absence? Come on in with us. As a press secretary, you're a guy to point out Eigelberger to you. Write your own ticket. I'll point him out for nothing, wish you luck, and you can take it from there. You don't go along with us? Well, I go along with you, fine. You give me a gun, a ready-made pardon, and I'll shoot the guy for you. I don't go for the paper hat and the tin sword. Do you know what it would mean to a man, Johnny, to break the Eichelberger syndicate? The DA's office, the governor's chair, seat in the Senate. That's right. I don't want any of it. Why not? 
No political ambitions. Clean hands, pure heart, and no political future, huh? That's me. You're a sucker, Johnny. Eichelberg is sitting on top of a $200 million empire. Have you got any idea what he'd do to protect that? Well, roughly. Let me ask another. You really know why you're in this? There's a job to be done. They tagged me. I... I was around. You were. You're a man who wants to do good. And they want a man to do good. Sure, you always wanted to do good. I don't say that's wrong. I say that's the way you are. You've been discovered. You made quite a splash at the university telling the other do-gooders the theory of how the law should be. You're made to order for them. So they suck you in with your clean hands and pure heart. Happy little amateur. A kid standing in the sun with books under his arm. And if a flagpole falls on you, it's just an accident. You don't think I'm up to the job? I think you give it one fine whirl. And I'll be cheering. It's all nice and cozy. Same old story. Election's a year off, and the governor's trying to stir up some free advertising for himself. Are well, you sure you don't want something else, Johnny? No, thanks, ma'am. You're beginning to sound like Jerry, Pop. What's Jerry say? He thinks I'm a sucker, a fall guy. Huh? Could be, but you're old enough to know your own mind. Are you working with him on this, Jerry? No, I'm painting a picture of a special prosecutor's home life. <laughs> well, I was afraid of that. <laughs> well, Jerry couldn't write anything we wouldn't like. Why, he's just like my own boy. I'm not so sure. The important thing is, Johnny, how you feel about all this. Well, Pop, I think it's great. I've always hoped that someday we'd work out a way to be closer. So far, our jobs haven't allowed it. Now we'll be together. What could be better than that, huh? Well, Johnny, I know, but I don't just see how you mean. Well, haven't you heard from the department yet? Heard what? By special request of the governor, you are my chief investigator. No, son. No, I won't have it. Why not, Pop? It's already been discussed. Well, then you can undiscuss it. I'm a cop, Johnny. Just a hard-working, hoodlum-pinching cop. And I want to stay that way. At least until they pension me off. I'll leave the brain work for you. You've got the education for it. But leave me where I'm comfortable, huh? Well, Pop, it's not as simple as that. I can get all the bright young men I want. But what I need most is a cop, an honest cop. One who knows this town. Pop, it's already been decided. Yeah. We'll talk about it later. Gosh, I, I thought he'd jump at it. Thanks for breakfast, Mrs. Conroy. I'll see you later. Yeah. You seen you, Mike. Oh, come back anytime, Jerry. Don't stay away so long. Uh, he'll see you in a minute. Okay, well, I'll have the answers tomorrow, all right, son? Hello, Harrigan. Mr. Eichelberger? Yeah? McKibben from the Chronicle. Well? I thought you'd like to make a statement. About what? Conroy. Sure, you can quote. I am happy that such an investigation has been started, since it can only clear me of all charges leveled against me by the gentlemen of the press of this city. 
Thank you. Any time. You're a friend of the Conroy's. How do you mean? You know them? No. Harrigan's a friend of Matt Conroy's. We all grew up in the same neighborhood. Mm, yes, years ago. One of the finest men I ever knew. I thought you kept that friendship up. You guys get the idea the diploma you get when you graduate from journalism school makes you different from anybody else. Don't believe it. That's a lot of money for a whiskey salesman to make. Even for a man that does sell whiskey. It's all on the income tax report. Of course it is. Now let's talk about the Manzanati's case. Never heard of it. I'll refresh your memory. 1948. Peter Manzanati's was a produce dealer who refused to pay to the organization. He took a trip to Canada and he never came back. Maybe that guy liked to travel. Keep your attention here. March 1948. You took a leave of absence from the police force. You were gone three weeks. A vacation. Did you like Canada? I've never been to Canada. You and Jimmy Chop went to Canada. You took Manzanati's to Canada and you murdered him. I said I've never been to Canada. I don't know Manzanati's and I never heard of Jimmy Chop. Manzanati's left town the same time as you and Jimmy Chop. It's a big town. People come, people go. March 27th, you resigned from the police force. On the same day, you went to work for Eichelberger. The second day, the first day, we talked terms. Selling whiskey? I didn't sell whiskey then. What did you do? Odd jobs. Killing people? Odd jobs like that? You're cute, too. The fact is that you were shaking down a lot of small-time bookmakers. Eichelberger got you off. He did you a favor, and you did him one. You arranged the Manzanati's killing. I never heard so much junk in my life. You were a cop, Silbray, and you sold out. Baloney. And if it's the last thing I do, I'm going to nail you. All right. Let's see if Jimmy Chop has a better memory. You can go, my friend. But not for long. I'd rather nail one crooked cop than a hundred hooligans. Get out. You just got to find that man's an artist woman. Shall I bore it? No, no, just leave it. I don't know when Mr. Conroy will be back. Understand anything else, miss? No, thank you. I have your story. Do you mind? I don't mind anything. There's plenty of hot coffee there. I must say you write very well. Thank you. But you don't think very much of us, do you? I think the whole bunch of you are clever as all get out. Huh. And I thought I said so in a style that was all but heroic. It's the style I mean. It uh, has a twist to it. Such as? Such as, uh, if the pulp mills of America can continue supplying enough paper to this efficient staff, something must come to light. The detached, cynical observer, faintly amused by the follies of other humans, well, if that's all there, I agree with you. I'm one fine writer. And it carries over into your personal attitude. McKibben, you're heavy with it. Get a firm hold on yourself. Thanks, I will. As a matter of fact, not all people are happiest being exhibitionists. But I am, I suppose. I didn't say that. Your trick of inference again. Forgive me for not rising. Proof of my exhibitionism, I imagine is for a girl whose experience with crime has been limited to a parking ticket. And you're quite a girl. To stick her nose into a professional cleanup campaign. Why should I... Walk barefooted through the pigsty. It had crossed my mind. Do you want me to tell you? Not particularly. You prefer your own explanation. Frankly, it doesn't make any difference one way or another. You're a handsome dame who does what she wants to do, so why worry about why? Well, I think we're in business. We've located Mrs. Manzanari's through a nephew of hers out in Oakmont. She's here, living at 446 Pond Street, under the name of Mrs. Stephen Nova. Oh, off the record, Jerry. This is not for publication. Naturally. Johnny, the first real break. If she'll talk, 
Better keep her on ice. Matt will, huh, Pop? Yeah, sure, son. Break off everything else in the morning. Matt will have her M of 10. Leave everything to me, Johnny. I'll have her here bright and early. We've waited a long time for this. See you in the morning. Right. Mandy, what do you say we chuck all this? Go out and have a real dinner somewhere. I'll even blow to a bottle of wine. Amanda prefers the simpler things of life. That's what you think. Come on with us, Jerry. No, thanks. I got to work. I'll see you later. Johnny, we've had leaks before. I can't help questioning the wisdom of... Question what, me? Forgot my copy. I don't blame you. If I were the professor, I'd question me, you, the DA, the whole kit and caboodle. I'd screen everybody. You know they've been screened. I'd screen them again. I'd get to know them intimately back to the time they were born. I'd question my own mother. It's open. Come in. To what do I owe the honor? I want to talk to you. Fine. No dinner with wine? I'm not going. What about your hurry to get to work? Oh, I had to do my flower arrangements. Have a seat. Thanks. Wasn't what you said when you left, wasn't, wasn't that meant to be provocative? If you're going to say something, get down to it. What did you mean when you said you'd question everyone? Just that. Won't you please sit down so I can throw myself at your feet? As you say, let's get down to it. Good. I uh, came here to ask you exactly what it is you've been holding behind your eyes these past weeks. I wish some of you ivory tower people would stop trying to be so smart. I wish you'd put your socks on and go home and sit by your fireplaces and read mystery stories where everything turns out nice and tidy in the end. If you must know, I think you're a square. And Johnny's a square. You're standing in a cold shoot and don't know it. And you're a whale of a tough guy, McKibben. I am. A real know-it-all guy. You know all about the viciousness. You're at home in the slime. You put your finger on all the bodies that have been buried, but you won't tell. Oh, no. That's too amateurish. That would destroy your pose. We're the, the dilettantes, and you're the tough professional. As one exhibitionist to another, why don't you cut it out? Come on. Four forty six. Wherein is hidden Mrs. Stefan Nova, alias Mrs. Manzanares. You understand, Mrs. Manzanares? We'll have men there. You won't know who they are, but they'll be there. And we'll know everything you say, everything you tell them. Are you not afraid? Of course not. You're an old woman, Mrs. Manzanares. What should you be afraid of? It is true. You have a nephew, Peter, works in a gas station in Oakmont. He's a fine boy, Peter. 
You're very fond of them. That's also true, isn't it, Mrs. Manzanares? All we want is peace, that's all. Just peace, Mrs. Manzanares. You put peace on your face tomorrow, and everything will be all right. All right. Selling insurance. Jerry, what are you doing out here? I want to see you. All right, come on in. What's the trouble? Is your wife asleep? Yeah. Sit down. I checked on 446 Palm Street. There wasn't a cop there. Well, I didn't think it necessary. Ackerman was there, though, with a couple of his goons teaching the facts of life to Mrs. Manzanati's. What? Don't act surprised. Why shouldn't they be? You called Harrigan right after you left us at the hotel. Jerry, you're crazy. I know you're working with Eichelberger, Matt. Specifically, Harrigan. You drunk? I've known it for three weeks. I tried to figure out what to do about it. Come to the conclusion that your problem. Jerry, this is nothing to joke about. Look, Matt, I grew up with Johnny. I know how he feels about you. Little tin god on the mantelpiece. It's always been that way. Partly the reason he's in this today. I don't think you want to see him torn to pieces any more than I do. Somebody's filling you with pap. And I don't want to see you in jail. Any more than I'd like to see you found in an alley staring up at a curbstone only not seeing it. Those are the only alternatives I've been able to come up with. Now you figure out one. I won't hear any more such talk. I'm going to print the story about what happened at Manzanati's today. Only for Johnny's sake, I'm going to leave you out of it. I'm going to give you a chance. It's a lie. But if you don't want him to find out that his father's been crossing him every day of the calendar, you better start figuring a way to get yourself clear. Get out! I'll give you 24 hours. Get this one thing through your head. We need each other in this thing. Maybe you need me more than I need you. But this is the last time I go running around just because somebody in this outfit blows a cork. You hear that, Eamon? Anything I got to turn over to you, I'll report just like I've been Knock doing. Knock it off. How do you explain this? The Kibben was there yesterday when we got the word on the Manzanati's woman. He was asked to respect the confidence. By who? By John. And you let it go with that? What was I to do, arrest him? People, man. And he hightails it down to Pond Street and sits on the curb. And you didn't think it important enough to tell us, Matt. Why was that? He's always kept his word before. You sap, you wooden headed sap. Take it easy, Matt. Wait outside for us. He's all right. Take my word for it. What kind of logic is that? A business like this depending on someone you think you can trust. Hasn't he told us everything so far? Small stuff. Stuff you put in the window to get the suckers inside. When it comes to a showdown, he'll pull a switch so fast, our necks will get twisted watching him. All right, that's enough from both of you. We built a great outfit, almost foolproof. But we've got the same weak links any business has. People. If we've got one or 500 people, we've got that many weak links. Starting right here. I want it known around. I want it circulated in their bloodstreams. Everybody's under glass from here on out. This Conroy kid is tougher than we thought. He's got angles, and it looks like staying power. We'll match him. Money, brains, time, anything else. Tell our men that. Lay it on the line. Tell them they're going to be under glass. I want a system set up. I want them to know there's a system. I want fear working for us. And we'll begin with Matt Conroy. she was. 
was. Take it just as an example of what you'll be up against all the way down the line. With all this money flowing from the book... It wasn't money, it was intimidation. One or the other. The fact remains, it proves there is a working pipeline. Oh, now, no, shop, Johnny. Skip it, please. This is why I wanted to get you out of the office for a minute or two. Come along, you haven't met everyone. Excuse Give him me. time. <laughs> He's young as a politician. <laughs> <laughs> well, gentlemen, what do you think of him? Hello, Jerry. Hi. You need all these witnesses to drum me out? You probably know everyone, don't you? Almost too well. Now, oh, nice hideout you've got here, Miss Waycross. Thank you. The bird's eye view of our very corrupt city. Jerry, May I get you a drink? Me. Hello, Johnny. This was a fine stunt. I gather Mrs. Manzanetti's did arrive at the hearing perfectly briefed. That's not the point. How did you know what was going on down at Pond Street? Shot in the dark. I guess you realize what this does to us. I printed a simple story that happened to be true. I thought it might help put pressure on. Anything wrong with that? If you can't see it... Tell me. It's a no-good tramp newspaper man's trick. Break any confidence for a little run-of-the-mill story. I thought something better of it. Okay, Professor. Jerry. Hello, Matt. I'd like to speak to you a minute, Jerry. I'm sorry, Jerry. Oh, forget it. Can I fix you something? All right, you're very sweet. Wrestle me up a ham sandwich. Jerry, I'm in a spot. I think I mentioned something about that last night. Yeah, I'm sorry I lost my temper. I suppose I admit what you said last night. Yeah. Then level with you. Yeah. Will you go along? That depends. Well, we both heard the same kind of stories hundreds of times. Unless you've been through it yourself, it's hard to understand. Try me. Jerry, the way they got it worked out, a cop is supposed to be something more than human. He's supposed to work harder than anybody, and be more honest than anybody, and pay for his own bullets when he shoots a crook. Naturally, he's not supposed to want money or things for his family. He's altogether too high principled for that. Well, it works out fine for a while, and then Somehow or other, you get to be 40. And you find yourself looking in the windows at the things other people look at. And you start wanting things. Because by this time, you've got a kid growing up. And you want some of the things for him. And then you find you're in debt. Then suddenly, you find some easy money in your pocket. And then you find they own you. So? Now they've got me in the nutcracker. How do you get out, Matt? You've got to help me, Jerry. If I believe you. I have never asked anything from anybody before. There's only one thing you can do. Deal behind Eichelberger's back. Sell Johnny on the idea you got a plant and feed him phony information. And try hard to stay alive. There's that, too. Or you can tell Johnny. No. I can't do that. I... Matt, how do you make me believe you're on the level? Eichelberger had me up this morning. There's a folder in the DA's files they're worried about. 1934, Lloyd Caslin. He blabbed about a lot of things that didn't make much sense then. They would now, if anybody wanted to put them together. The old days, that's what they're worried about. They want me to get that folder for them. Now, how do I duck that and stay alive? I think that's fine. I think it's just great. And do they want it? Tonight. Get it and give it to them. Only first have it photostatted. I may be tailed. You ought to know how to handle that. Hi, thanks. See you soon. Oh, thanks, Jerry. I'll, I'll see about it. All right, Matt. 
Don't mind if I eat as I run? Where are you going? Say, is your car downstairs? In the garage. Lend me your keys? No. Operator, this is Miss Waitcross's apartment. Would you order a cab right away? Thank you. See you later. Hello, operator. This is Miss Waycross. Please cancel that cab. I've got to run out. The others won't mind, I hope. Mandy. Yes? Do you mind telling me what you're doing? I, I don't think it's just curiosity. I think it's business. I, I don't know. All right. I'm awfully dark down in love with you. Yes, sweet Johnny. Explain it to your politicos, will you? Sure. I canceled the cab. Come on, get in. I'll drive you. Move over. Thanks, Stu. You're the doctor these days. How about it, Buck? There's no trick to photostate for your man, but it's against the rules. There are no rules for this committee. Wait here. I'll be right back. Just here. I'm holding him in my hands right now. Make the photostat and let him have it. No, let him have it. It don't mean a thing, not a thing. Right. I guess I'm not supposed to ask you who you've been following and why. No. But I, I suppose it was all right. What? Whatever it is, I'm not supposed to ask you. It was quite all right. Relax a little, McKibben. Perhaps we both should. Jerry, I know what you think of me. I guess I knew that day you met me and looked at me. I got into this because of Johnny, because he was in it. And because I have so much respect and admiration for him. And I thought I might help in some way. And I wanted to be doing something of some use. Can't you understand that? Yeah, sure. I still want to help. But you've made it so it isn't easy anymore. And, Jerry, I'm beginning to be afraid. It's going to be all right. Is it? You relax a little. I'm hungry. We time before we go looking for the next body. Okay. So there you have it. The life and times of one Amanda Waycross. Not very inspirational. I'd say very dull. This novel you wrote. What was it about? About three chapters. I mean, content. About young love in Mississippi. 
Mind me not to read it. You bet I will. There's one point in your life story that escapes me. Yes. I mean Johnny. I know. Well. I went up to State U to interview him for one of my fine reviews. And strangely enough, he didn't turn against you. No. He fell in love with you. I suppose so. Was it immediate? Instant. You have that kind of effect. What a nice thing to say. You ought to know it by now. It's getting late. Does it matter? Supposed to. May I help you clean up? No, thanks. I'll leave it for Alan. You want me to go? Yes. Mandy, you're not much good as a cloak and dagger woman. We've been yapping all night, and what have you found out from me? I've found out enough. We both have. Something we didn't want to know. Do you want me to go now? Yes. Here. You wanted to be careful, didn't you? You could be going home to lunch. Would have been simpler to mail it. Neil's waiting for you. Why? Something about John. Where? In the oil station up the street. Nothing to be done for him. I guess somebody better call the police. Dump Dump never knew what hit him. Neither of them knew what that was. Where'd you say it was, Ed? 34th and Schuyler. Yeah, okay. A fine guy like that, and some little two bits deep. I almost wish Matt hadn't got it. I wish we could have had him for a small while, just a short while. Are you satisfied with it, Flint? Can't find much wrong. Twenty witnesses, they all tell him. Big sister act, huh? Yeah, the usual thing. He was
was the unlikeliest man in town to get killed, wasn't he, Clint? In a manner of speaking. A hood wouldn't put a finger on him. No. He had a badge on his vest and a paper in his pocket, and the paper said nobody could touch him. What's eating you? Don't you think the department takes care of its own? You got a good question there. Let's both think of an answer to it. No connection has been established between his death and his official position with the Crime Commission. Now you'll have to excuse me. Will you come with me? John. Johnny, I'm so sorry. Matt Conroy and I grew up in the same neighborhood. I'll miss him. He was a fine man. And his widow should be proud of the way he served his community. As I said to Mr. Martin, I said, that was just like Matt Conroy. Brave as a tiger, that's what he was. Brave as a tiger. Thank you very much, Mrs. Martin. You're very kind. Mary, is there anything I can do for you? And to think that such a brave man should be killed by such hoodlums. Jerry. Yeah? I think I should know. What? I think it's important to all of us. Know what? About Matt. What about Matt? Step in front of a bullet and now he's waiting to be buried. What else? Jerry, don't close me out. I've never felt so lost. Last night, everything seemed so simple. Andy? Yes? You don't believe it was accidental? No. Why not? What did you and Matt talk about at my place? Why did you follow him downtown? Years ago, it, it seems he took some money. I gather it was to put Johnny through college. They were using him. And upon my excellent advice, he tried to double-cross them. Oh, Jerry. What do I do now? Call the cops? And what do I tell Johnny about his father? That he was a crook? And how can I tell him about us now? Mandy, would you... Would you come in a minute and help Mother? Station WRRG again takes you to the offices of the Crime Commission where John Conroy and his staff continue their relentless questioning of witnesses alleged to be connected with the so-called syndicate Conroy is out to break. Mr. Eichelberger, we'd like to ask you about some of the statements you made to our investigators, if you don't mind. Not at all. Glad to talk about anything. For my part, Mr. Conroy, I'll be happy to get on the record and clean up some of the things they've been printing about me. I've got a statement here I'd like to read. Uh, you can put it in the record later. All right. You're in the trucking business, Mr. Eichelberger. That's right. Have been for years. Run a lot of trucks. And how would you estimate your income for that business? Well, it's all on the tax records, Mr. Conroy. I couldn't say offhand. Well, would you say about $100,000? Yes, I guess so. A little more or less. And, uh... You have other sources of income? That's right. Will you tell us what they are? Well, they're varied. I own a few pieces of other businesses, and I lend a good deal of money here and there. Charge interest. You lend money to bookies? Well, that I couldn't say. I lend money to people I know. What they do with it, I don't always know. Uh, they could be bookies, some of these people. They could at that, Mr. West. Some of them I wouldn't know. And the control of all this money, Mr. Eichelberger, wouldn't you say that gives you control of these bookies? No, I wouldn't. That's what they like to say about me, czar of the bookies. That's nonsense. It isn't true. I lend money just like a bank does. Did it ever occur to you, Mr. Eichelberger, did you ever suspect for a moment that this money was being used for illegal purposes? I worried about it for years. <laughs> Anybody who has as many friends as I have is bound to know a few. 
And in these times, you, you come to realize that you could be sitting on a powder keg and not knowing it. You see, a lot of people helped me get started, helped me a lot. So uh, how can I always act like a bank? You would get notes for these loans, as you call them, Mr. Eichelberger? Sometimes, yes. They would be given to you directly? Well, one way or another. And if stock was the security, it would be registered to you? Sometimes, yes. I'm assuming that you are a good businessman, Mr. Eichelberger. Well, that I'll go along with. And that you'd see that these loans to these friends of yours would be handled in a businesslike way. You watch your pocketbook, you'll learn that. Did you occasionally buy these stocks? Well, uh, I guess you could call it that. Sometimes I'd buy them and hold them, sometimes I wouldn't. Sometimes I'd just put them in the safe. And on the occasions when you did buy them, you'd use some sort of clearinghouse for these security transactions, I suppose. Yeah, that's right. Isn't it a fact, Mr. Eichelberger, that you own a company for just that purpose? No, that's not true. I don't own it. I have some shares in a securities company. What company is that? Well, I'd like to consult with my lawyer. Go ahead. One, Arco Securities. I've done some business with them, among others. And the cash transactions, you kept a record of those? <laughs> Mr. Conroy, you make it sound like I was loaning millions. As a matter of fact, you were, weren't you? That is, if we accept for a moment the premise that they were all loans? No, I wasn't. That's what comes of all this sensationalism, the kind of stuff the papers have been printing. A guy makes a $2 bet, he's a big gambler. I'd lend a few bucks and I'm a czar. You wish to say that there is not a large, thoroughly organized syndicate centered in this city? I don't know about it being organized, but as long as gambling is illegal and profitable, it'll always be there. Tell me, Mr. Conroy, how many people in this room do you believe never made a $2 bet? <laughs> Station WRRG returning you to the Harrison Hotel, headquarters of the Conroy Committee. John Conroy continues his questioning of Miss Lillian Smith, former lady friend of Roy Ackerman. That's when you came back from Florida. Yeah, right about that time, I guess. And you gave a series of parties here in the city? I didn't give any parties. Some fellas gave parties. If I give parties, I gotta pay for them. Why should I do that when the parties are for fellas? Did Roy Ackerman come to any of these parties? That schmo. I wouldn't even have him around. <laughs> How much money did you have when you came back from Florida? I don't know. 15,000, 20,000, more or less. How should I know? Five or six thousand dollars wouldn't make any difference to you. I don't know much about money. I just use it for spending. Where did you get the money? From fellas. Where else? That's a silly question. <laughs> <laughs> this meeting will recess until 2 p.m. WRRG now brings you the third day of the Conroy Committee investigations. John Conroy has, for the past hour, been attempting to break down the testimony of another alleged member of the Eichelberger Syndicate. That was in June 1935. What was your salary at that time? Uh, I think it was 80 bucks a week. Who paid it to you? Uh, Arco. Arco what? Arco Securities Company. Did Arco employ you? I don't know. I made a deal with Roy. Roy Ackerman? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. But you said you were paid by the Arco Securities Company. I said I got my checks from Arco. Were you ever arrested and questioned? Hmm? Maybe I was. I don't remember. You don't remember being arrested for murder? Uh, the cops can get in the habit of hauling a guy in. And you gave bond for $25,000? Huh? You say I did, I did. Didn't you? Okay, okay, I did. Where'd you get the money? What, for the bond? Uh, I sold some stock. $25,000 worth of stock on an $80 salary. Well, uh, 
No, well, you see, I had... Uh... Let me remind you that you're under oath. To whom did you sell the stocks? Uh, well, uh, I think, uh, it was a long time ago. Maybe it was Arco. Uh, look, I don't know from nothing. He's got a head on him. It isn't a case of finding a buried body. It's a case of mathematical law. Thousand stray pieces of information. He connects them right. He can spell out the whole story. Well, whether he knows it or not, he's got it all right here. I wouldn't have believed it. Arco. Almost every other page, Arco. Where did the money come from, Arco? What was the holding company, Arco? Well, it had to be, Neil, for the income tax record. Twenty years it worked for the Federals. Now comes along the professor with a bee in his pants. And gets lucky. It isn't luck. It's hard work. He's building step by step, setting a trap. Then he'll subpoena Arco's books and spring it. Tonight, tomorrow morning, the next day. What's wrong with our just losing the books? It wouldn't stand. It would mount the same as a confession. There's no way to do it small. The whole billing will have to go. Go? Even the fire department gave us a couple of notices that the gas furnace was dangerous. But there are apartments above the place. A dozen people live there. You can wake them up and carry them out. You'll be a hero. Neil, you can't. You wouldn't believe we'd do it? No. That's what makes it good. I don't think a jury would believe it either. He loves the way he says good night. Just a kid. All right, all right. Why don't we get on with it? Get going. Business. Yeah, but the rock this place is going to get, there won't be anything big enough to put together. Okay. Okay, turn it on. I'll dig on this for the rest of my life if necessary.
anybody get out alive? One or two still fighting. But won't be by morning. That's more or less the official opinion. Did you go up there? Yeah. Maybe you can get it across to your readers. These aren't just a lot of gangsters killing each other. But the people of this fine Midwestern city are in danger of their lives in their own beds. They ought to make quite a story. The story's here. Yeah. I should have listened to you months ago. You suggested I wasn't the man for the job. I've changed my mind. And we both have. I wonder how long it'll take me to get the smell of that burned flesh out of my nose. You can't blame yourself. Can't I? You warned me, Fogel, the police. What was it you said about me, Jerry? I was a kid standing in a hot sun with a dream on my face. That's past, Johnny. Take a look at those files, evidence, testimony, thousands of pages of them. And to what purpose? Can't even be used for wallpaper. <laughs> to get anywhere now to unify a case against Eichelberger would take a major piece of criminal evidence. According to the police, they'll have a lead on the explosion in 48 hours. What's your own opinion? Before they can get anything that'll tie Eichelberger to it, if they ever do, your commission will be dead and buried. You know that? Yeah. Well, so what? Shall we strike off a medal commemorating Mr. Eichelberger? How many more people do you want me to kill? I've dug up a story, a murder story. And if we play it right and have any luck, we can panic them into making a sucker move. What murder? If we can get one man close enough to go into the chair, the whole couple spill over. What murder? I'm going to knock you to your knees again, Johnny. You'll have to get me on my feet first. Matt's murder. That wasn't a thief shooting his way out of a store. It was a planned execution all the way down the line to the double cross of the little guy they used. Why? What would be their motive? Matt was working with them. He told me so himself. He was trying to shake loose. Oh. I don't believe it. Of course not. Check it yourself. Take a look at his income tax returns from 1939 on. Johnny. Yes, ma'am. Well, what is this? You've been down here two hours. Nothing, ma'am. Just some papers of Dad's I wanted to see. Well, wouldn't you like something? A glass of milk? No, thanks, ma'am. We've got to get back downtown. Well, is there something wrong? Nothing more than usual. stop you from printing it, Jerry. All you have to do is ask. My father was a crooked cop. You can decide how much good it will do to publicize that and what it will do to my mother. But before you decide, you must know that I'm quitting. I'm getting out. Johnny. That means the whole investigation collapses. They can appoint someone else. Will they? You know they won't. They'll dig into the record and find out that all this time and all this money produced absolutely nothing. That the sacred investigation was a complete flop. And from then on, they'll play political hopscotch. A committee will be appointed to investigate the investigation. And in due time, they'll return with a comprehensive report that will be promptly filed and forgotten. And in the meantime, the people will wind up right where they were, at the mercy of the hoodlums. Is it important to you? Yes, it is. You're the boy in the sun now, huh? Maybe I am, Johnny. But something occurs to me. 
even allowing for the apathy of the people and their lack of integrity and their occasional lack of intelligence. And that's the fact that they all want desperately to believe in a certain majesty of the law. And for people like us, like you and me, the greatest crime in law is the lack of faith in the law. And that's when we join hands with the hoodlums. If they can convince us of the uselessness of knocking out crime, the difficulty, the fact that personal sacrifices may be too great, then we might as well hand over the city and the state and the nation, too, to the Neil Eichelbergers and let them run it for us. It's a very late point of view, coming from you, but a timely one, I suppose, in terms of a newspaper story. But I don't think I need a speech about honor and integrity from either one of you. I understood what you meant about Jerry and me. I'm sorry I couldn't have told you. It's unimportant. I can't apologize. I ask your forgiveness. I can only ask you to try and understand and believe that we tried very hard not to have it happen. But, Johnny, don't let this influence your decision. If you walk out now, you'll regret it all your life. Isn't it a tragic thing if people all over this nation can be told that a man like Eichelberger can tear a man like you apart with his dirty fingers? What are we coming to, Johnny? When a man like that can do this to all of us. Hello. This is Conroy. Hello, Johnny. I'm holding a press conference in my office at 10 o'clock. I'm giving them the facts about my father. You gonna stick with the job? Yes. I'm calling you now so you can have whatever lead this will give you. Johnny, what about your mother? I think you pointed out that sometimes a few people have to pay an exorbitant price to help the law. I want to talk to Mr. Mr. McKibben. Hello. Mr. McKibben? Yes, who's this? Well, you don't know me, Mr. McKibben. I just read your story. Well, that's nice, but who is this? My name's Carmelina. Carmelina who? It, it doesn't matter. It's about Marty LaRue. Where are you, Carmelina? Was that honestly how he was killed? Yes, it was. I can prove it to you. Where are you? Sorry you did, are you? Was that how he was killed? Yes, exactly the way I wrote the story. They just shot him like that after we did it for him? They planned to double cross him. He didn't have a chance. Were you his wife? Yes, but I didn't want him to get into it. Of course not. I couldn't stop him. He was crazy. I don't know what got into him. 
He was crazy to be a big guy. I know. They told him they'd make him a big guy. Who told him, Connolly? Say. Were you there when they made the deal? In the next room. But you heard them? Yes. Did you see Monty's body, Carmelina? There was a hole smashed right through his head. You'd like to have him pay for that, wouldn't you? Yeah, that's what I want. Who was there, Carmelina? A fellow named Roy. Roy Ackerman? Yeah, and a, a fellow named Herm. What was his last name? What's the matter? Keep your head down. How'd they know you were here? I don't know. I live in the next block. Have they seen you? Yes. Are they coming? No. When they start this way, I want you to get up and walk toward that door. Walk, do you understand? They'll kill me. They'll kill us. I should have called. I want you to walk toward that door. Do you hear me? They're coming. Go ahead. Hey, lady! and arrange for a spot break on every station at hourly intervals. Good. Now, here it is. Carmelina, give yourself up to the police. As long as you are at large, you are in danger of your life. The police are your only protection. You got it? Good. Carmelina LaRue, described as female, 27 years, 5 foot 6 inches and 116 pounds. Large, dark eyes, black hair, olive complexion. Don't worry, Roy. We'll find her. We'll find her. Or well, the cops will. I said stop worrying. <laughs> what's the matter with you, Roy? I'll tell you what's the matter. That dame is the only person in the world with a finger that can point. And can point straight at me. She ran, didn't she? She knows better than to talk. She talked to McKibben. You know it wouldn't stand in court. Who'll be sitting in court, Neil? Waiting to see if it'd stand or not. I'll tell you who. Me. And I'll tell you something else. This guy McKibben is the only guy who can identify the LaRue dame. Anybody else they bring in is just a frightened dame. But he knows her. Neil, the day he shoved his nose in, our luck started going bad. You go ahead and worry about the court. I'm going to change our luck. You'll do nothing of the kind. The first and only blunder we made was in knocking off Matt Conroy. You didn't think so at the time. I do now. Now get this, Roy. This is a positive order. Lay off McKibben. We'll find her, and we'll wash it up. I want Detroit, Logan, 60126. Hello? Who wants him? This is Harry Roy. What's all that noise? Just playing some old records I just got in. Hey, turn that thing off. Now, Roy. Look, you still got that guy Red around? Red? Are you kidding? He's right here. I'd like to borrow him. OK. When do you want him? Now. Put him on a plane right away. You're my pal. You're my pal, Jerry. But I hear nothing. Keep working, Pink. Find Ackerman and don't let him out of your sight. Let me know if he even coughs. 
Okay, it's a deal. Come on, girls. Step up. We're over the end. Hands down. All right, now, girls, keep your heads up and your hands by your sides. Hey, you with the white blouse, wake up. Keep your head up there. Jerry, any of these? No. All right, Mac, keep sweeping. He says it's none of these. But don't pick up the same gals all night. That's all. But, Jerry, yeah, you better stay here. Why? We don't want to lose you, sweetheart. You're the only one who can identify the girls. They know that as well as we do. I'm touched with your concern. You stay here. Listen, Clint. There's a girl out there somewhere scared to death with every hoodlum in town looking for her. We'll get her. Yeah, you've done fine so far. I suppose you'll know just where to look. Maybe not, but I started with her. The least I can do is stay on my feet. Take a couple of men with you. You got a couple of men left, let them look on their own. McKibben, your paper on the phone. Hello. Jerry, I got a call for the board. Sammy Lester, you know him? Lester? No. He says he used to manage Monty. Monty LaRue? Says he knows the girl. May have a tip for you. Won't talk to anybody but you. Okay, put him on, Ed. Hold it. Hello. Yeah, this is McKibben. Where are you? In a drugstore on Canal Street. Yeah? Maybe I can give you something. Sure, what do you got? Well, not on the phone. Where are you? At the fights. Listen, I'll leave a ticket at the box office for you. Come along. I'll take the next seat as soon as I can get away. I got a boy in about here. How do I know you, Sammy? How do I know what this is? You're not worried, are you, pal? In the middle of the stadium, how safe can you get? Now, look, I don't want any trouble. OK, Sam. Mr. Conroy, Miss Conroy, she's here. She's here. I'm John Conroy. There's nothing to be afraid of now. You are Carmelina. Yes. Here, drink this. This testimony and the mass of other stuff, you've got them. I think so. In any court in the land. And they'll break now. No question. All right, let's pick them up. Everyone on the list. Eichelberg, Ackerman, all of them. Come let's on. go get them, boys. Mike, stay here, will you? What about Jerry? Still haven't got him. Well, stick with it. I'd, I'd like him to be in on this. Hello, Ed. Yes. At the fights, he couldn't be. Where? At the fights. Why the fights? Yes. Yes. They said he got a tip about Carmelina. I don't like it. Tell him to hold on. Hold it, Ed. Have you still got a detail downstairs? Yeah, still standing by. Get it and get over to the arena quick. Yes, sir. Take charge. This is Dave Fogel. How about that information? <laughs> That's him. Get him in your mind, Red. There's no chance for a mistake. I can pick him out in a million. You satisfied with the setup? You know, man, I can find a guy across this whole gym. Let me work it out.
great shot from up here. Yeah. I've seen Ackerman here. He fingered you when you come in. Some out of town guy is going to put the gun on you. Get out of here, but don't get in the clear.
Admit, I never thought I'd see that. Let's go. There was a shooting at the arena at the fights. One of Ackerman's gunmen got Jerry McKibben. Let's get moving. Come on. Sometimes someone has to pay an exorbitant price to uphold the majesty of the law. He said so himself.